Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with Dave's Faves. And today I want to talk to you about Janacek's Glagolitic Mass. Now, that has to be one of the most unfortunate titles ever given to a major phenomenal piece of music. I mean, a Glagolitic Mass. First of all, it's a Mass. And when you think of Mass, you think of like churchy stuff, right? And nothing could be further from the truth. This piece is wild. I mean, it makes Carmina Burana sound tame. I'm not kidding. So there's that aspect of it. And then there's the glagolitic part. And glagolitic is a script. It's a script that sets the text in Old Church Slavonic, which has its advantages and its disadvantages. The disadvantage is that you don't really probably understand much Old Church Slavonic. The advantage is that we don't care about Old Church Slavonic, and it doesn't matter whether you understand it or not. So you can just listen to the screaming and yelling and the vibrant rhythms and primal energy and barbaric splendor and insane organ writing and all of that stuff and not worry a bit about what they're yakking about which I think is a tremendous advantage. Now, the recording that I adore, above all else, is Charles McCarris with the Czech Philharmonic on Superfawn with an amazing bunch of soloists headed off by Elizabeth Söderström. And then there's Drahomira Drobkova and Frantisek Livora and Richard Novak, the famous bass, um, Czech bass, with the Czech Philharmonic Choir. And, I, you know, it's just amazing. It doesn't get better than this. It really doesn't. It's very well recorded. It's just glorious. Now, I do have to say a couple things, however, about the edition, because they are trying to do a Bruckner on Janacek. Janacek, as some of you may know, was one of the most impractical composers that ever lived. He didn't care whether you could play it or not play it or what it looked like or how he wrote it or, you know, he, he just, he was so impulsive and so just full of, of energy and, 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 and primal passion. He like scribbled it all down, gave it to the copyist. He put it in shape. Then they played it. And then he discovered that they couldn't sing it or they couldn't perform it. You know, his, his, his favorite key was like G flat major, which is just horrendous, you know, for the strings. And, and he wrote in strange rhythms and, and, and tiny little twitchy motives. And oh gosh, he was so, so impractical. You know, and he would write things for like incredibly screamy high trumpets and totally low trombones and basses with nothing in the middle. And it, it all just looked so weird on the page and sounded so fabulous when you actually played it, if you could play it at all. So once this thing was initially performed, he revised it. He revised it on the advice of some people to make it a little bit more practical. But the fact of the matter is that as usual with this story, there's always a story. And the story always runs like this, and it doesn't matter who the composer is. The composer wrote something, and it was just full of his naive genius or her naive genius and, and, and very impractical, but the impracticality is part of the aesthetic and really ought to be taken seriously. And it was only under pressure from other people that he revised it, so we need to go back to his original version, and it's all bullshit. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, nine times out of ten, when a composer revises something, it's because they finally got a chance to hear it and they decide they need to fix it to get it right. And that is a fact, my friends. Absolutely a fact. So now it is true that Janicek was quite impractical and it is true that people were always telling him to redo things. And sometimes he did. He took advice. Taking advice is the most natural thing in the world. It doesn't mean you're compromising your aesthetics or your, your, your you know, ethics or your, your primal original inspiration. It doesn't mean any of that. It means you know how to listen <laughs> and that you can take some good advice. The revised version of the Mass is a little bit more grandiose. It is a little bit easier to play, but it's wonderful. And if you compare it to the original version, it's vastly better than the original version. Virtually every bit that Janicek changed sounds better as a result of that change. Now, Makaris, who was a tremendous Janicek scholar, as we know, went back to the original. He found some bits that he thought 
might sound interesting if he restored them. But Macaris, you have to remember, I mean, I knew the man fairly well. He was, he was a, a questing spirit. He did things just to hear them. He did things as an experiment. And so, yes, he would put things back and rearrange them and he'd enjoy it because he loved music. He loved everything. He didn't, you know. But, uh, but the, the judgment of history isn't always wrong. And in this particular performance, he adds back some very high-lying soprano parts in the Sanctus. And that's the only change he makes. The rest of it is all the regular thing we know, and it sounds perfectly fine. And the best way to handle, for example, a critical edition or something like that, when you're trying to produce a score or a text, is to give performers the option of doing it or not doing it. It's like, okay, these are legitimate options. You can try them. How legitimate they are really depends on whether we know anything about what the composer's own feelings were. And in this case, we really don't. We really don't know, know what Janicek thought. The only thing we do know is that he made these revisions and was satisfied with the final version as it stood. In the meantime, some other people have gone back and reinstated all of the early stuff in a totally separate score. And they've even come out with like an interim middle version, which never existed ever and was never performed ever on the way to getting the final version. It's exactly what's happened with Bruckner. You know how they created this interim version of the Eighth Symphony that never existed? It was just like a working sketch. And now they're saying, oh, it's the third version of the Eighth Symphony. It's such a bad idea. It's so foolish. It's so ridiculous. It's so, it's so artistically illegitimate and so totally disrespectful to the intention of the composer. Now, Macaris recorded that original version, um, which is interesting to hear. It's on Chandos, and, you know, that's, that's fine. That's fine. So there are two versions out there, and they really ought not to be mixed up, I think, um, ordinarily. Although, you know, if you want to, and, and you know, you know the, the ends justifies the means. Let's put it that way. If you can't give a stunning performance without putting the little dooji, hooji, wuchi in the later version, then do it. What the heck? But the bottom line is, the bottom line is, this is a great glagolitic mass of the normative version of the glagolitic mass with a couple of bars added in the Sanctus. And it's absolutely fabulous. It is much better than Janicek's original thoughts, which he basically tried them out. I mean, you know, why do we assume? Why do we make these assumptions? Because we have to justify what we're doing. But the justification is often just so either illogical or illegitimate or just plain, honest to God, deceptive. And I don't like deceptive. I like fabulous. And that's what this glagolitic mass is. Absolutely fabulous. So keep on listening, my friends. Thank you so much for joining me and letting me rant about the nonsense that's being perpetrated on Janicek's music now, too. Oh, heaven help us. God save us from musicology. Take care.